Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second annual New, Jer New Jersey Self-Direction Conference. My name is Amy Yedley, and I work for Values into Action and the Collaborative for Citizen Directed Supports New Jersey on behalf of this year's planning committee. I am honored to introduce to you the legendary Frank Latham, who will be presenting on the topic of shared dis supportive decision making, making my voice count. Frank, it's all you. Great. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. It'll all go according to plan. Let's see. There we go. Outstanding. So today we want to talk a little bit about supportive decision making and the council comes at this from a really unique position that being we are part of the a state team that received a national grant to do some supportive decision making in new jersey particularly um, and i think one of the things that you discover when you look at how New Jersey currently um, allows individuals with disabilities. Um, it's a pretty limited menu. It's either you are under complete um, uh, control or nothing. Uh, and guardianship, although um, not the best choice, I think affording individuals with disabilities, the opportunity to be able to, to have a, a broader menu um, is good for everybody. I think it grows the advocates opportunity to, to learn how to, to be better advocates. But I also think it can be really beneficial to families to see the individuals that they're supporting grow and um, take on more responsibility for directing their lives. So, one of the concerns that always jumps out us at us is the balancing support and protection. Uh, and, and we want to always make sure that individuals are protected. Um, but sometimes the default mode, especially in New Jersey, as it's currently configured is guardianship. Um, and guardianship can be really restrictive. Um, in terms of what it takes away from individuals. Supportive decision-making, on the other hand, can be tailored in a way that can be really helpful for individuals who may have strengths or weaknesses in a particular area and may need some additional support. And it allows them to be able to choose those individuals that they would like to have supporting them. And I think, uh, as we look at opportunities to develop this, particularly in the state of New Jersey, um, we can see how successful it's been in other parts of the country where they've made the commitment to include supportive decision-making as part of the broader menu of options for individuals with disabilities and all of the good things that come along. So let's be clear about the different kinds of guardianship. So there's partial or limited guardianship. Um, and that really does, um, in some cases, allow self-advocates with their input or permission um, to make decisions. Um, but that that is oftentimes not really an option for us in New Jersey because we don't have the, the option to say we would like partial guardianship almost always when a student turns 18, um, the school will ask their parents to sign a guardianship agreement. And one of the things that we've learned kind of through experience is that guardianship agreement is oftentimes one of the more difficult things to change um, or get reversed. So once that guardianship is granted, 
even if the individual over time changes, is able to make better decisions, has learned through their experience like all of us have, that guardianship is really, really difficult to reverse. One of the things that we think can be really helpful is the opportunity to, to look at supportive decision-making as an alternative to guardianship, where people with disabilities use friends, families, and professionals to help them understand and make decisions that they face around life choices. Um, I oftentimes give this example. Um, when I was a much younger man, um, in a, a, a what I thought was a, a different lifestyle, I, I did some modeling and, and got a really big check. And my really big check, first thing I wanted to do was go out and buy a car. And uh, parents, being good parents, said, you know, you'll have to put some of the money away. You can use the rest of the money for um, whatever you like. And I kind of had my eyes set on a particular car. Uh, my parents advised me not to to buy this particular car. Didn't have a great mechanical record. Um, I went ahead and bought it anyway. And from a looks standpoint, it was an unbelievable car. It was convertible. Um, I was young, um, loved driving around with the top down, but it didn't run well enough to drive around with the top down very often. I share that story because it demonstrates that although um, I was given the choice uh, to make on my own, what ended up happening was, you know, that was just a bad choice. And the good thing, my parents didn't prevent me from buying anything else for the rest of my life. Oftentimes, when we think about guardianship and, and taking the opportunity and the responsibility away from individuals with disabilities to, to make those kind of decisions, they don't learn from um, choices that they make. And oftentimes, when they're charged with making choices, if they're not under a guardianship agreement, they haven't had the practice because we believe very strongly that supportive decision-making um, is a skill that you can grow. Every person with or without disability makes decisions every day. We make decisions about what we wear, how we look, the things we want to do, the people that we want to hang out with and interact with. Um, so whether or not we call it guardianship or supportive decision-making, the actual function we are oftentimes providing opportunities for folks to make decisions. The difference between guardianship and supported decision is really the legal construct. And the legal construct is once somebody has a guardianship, um, they are no longer the driver of their own life. It is somebody else's responsibility to make those choices for them. So, Supportive decision-making is a skill, and we believe that to be true. And as is the case with, with so many skills, what you learn to do over time is, is get better at it because it is something that you're learning to do um, through highs and lows, through great decisions and through not so great decisions. But all of that is added information for moving forward in supportive decision-making gives you um, a supportive team to help you both grow that skill, but also um, support you in areas that you may not have the same level of expertise and or experience as somebody else. And they can lend that expertise and or experience where they really do gain something really valuable. Um, my example of the car, um, I, I, I'm pretty confident um, in my car purchase since that time, but if I hadn't had the opportunity to maybe um, not have the best of choices on the front end, I think it would have been really difficult moving forward to go, this is an experience that, that I've learned from, and I've built a, a set of skills and am in a much better space to be able to move forward. So justice for Jenny. Uh, 
Jenny was somebody who, who wanted to have the opportunity to make some of her own decisions. And there was a real kind of fight to be able to remove her from guardianship and allow her to make some of those decisions for herself. So supportive decision-making and providing power of attorney are options that we should look at first. Oftentimes, especially here in New Jersey right now, one of the first things that we do is opt for guardianship, as opposed to looking at less restrictive, more inclusive, and more um, empowering opportunities. for folks to make as many or as few decisions as they are able to. And one of the things that we here in New Jersey, particularly the council, um, support supportive decision-making is because it's something that is kind of a living, breathing document. So as somebody's skills and or skill set grows, we can oftentimes change that supportive decision-making agreement to have folks um, take on more responsibility. And if it, it, you know, the good thing is it works in both directions. If that individual needs some additional support, we can also tailor that supportive decision-making decision to be able to, the supportive decision-making document to be able to reflect that at least temporarily or permanently, this individual may need some additional support. Three main concepts. Everyone has the right to their own decisions after the age of 18. What oftentimes happens is for um, any number of folks that that becomes something that at the age of 18, we're asking folks to make a decision that at least how we currently have it configured in New Jersey will impact them for the rest of their life. Again, having guardianship reversed is a really, really difficult uh, endeavor. Uh, so we believe that self-advocates should be involved in decision makings that affect their lives. And, and one of the best ways to do that is creating a strong circle of support and that circle of support can reflect folks that you value and trust, um, folks that can help you make decisions around areas that you may need some additional support around, but also be a, a sounding board when there are areas that you are very confident and, and have experience of being able to make good decisions. So it's really important to be able to, to, to look at um, how we can support individuals with disabilities around supportive decision making. We really believe that as an alternative to guardianship, um, without discussing whether or not guardianship is good or bad, what we believe um, and believe really strongly is that the more options individuals have and the more empowered they are to to exercise their own will around those decisions is always going to be a good thing because it's going to grow both their skill set and expose them to opportunities to make decisions that they might not typically have. So this is kind of how supportive decision making works. Supportive decision making starts with a self-advocate talking to their friends, family members, professionals, and people that they trust about their abilities to make decisions with support. Um, I would suggest that all of us in, at some level use supportive decision-making every day. Now, oftentimes 
when we think about supportive decision making, when we talk about individuals with disabilities, it's a much more structured um, space that they're in. So it may be something that's written. It may be the opportunity to have something much more formal. But most of us um, have a core group of folks, whether they be friends or family members or, or other folks in, in professional realms that are really great sounding boards when it's time to make a decision. Somebody who has more experience with, with something than you might have. Somebody who's already done some of the things that you want to do. So oftentimes we all are using supportive decision making. What we want to make sure that um, we bring to New Jersey is the opportunity for that to happen for people um, who have disabilities and to add additional options to what is currently just guardianship. Choosing supporters is, is a really, really important part of supportive decision making. What we want to make sure that we do are people who um, are both connected to us, but people who, who are both comfortable, but also folks who really know us. Um, and I think that, that there are so many areas that we can find folks who are um, people who feel comfortable and have familiarity with us around any number of life areas, um, kind of the things we do in daily living, physical and mental health, um, education and training, money and finances, home, work friends, free time, social outlets, dating and romantic partnerships, caring for a child, um, and pet care. These are just a few of the areas that um, supportive decision making can be broken out into. So you may be great about um, what you want to do in terms of work. Um, you may be, you may need some additional support around things like managing your finance. Um, you may have strong opinions about dating and romantic partnerships, opinions that oftentimes your friends can help and support you. Um, they can share information based on their level of experience that you may or may not have. And those kind of things can be really important when you start to develop a team around um, people who are going to support you in your um, supportive decision making. But most important, the thing that we believe is so valuable about supportive decision making is having your voice heard. Um, I oftentimes, when I go out and do presentations in person, ask any of the folks who are in the room what their favorite colors are. Um, and one of the reasons I, I ask that question is because oftentimes people have really strong opinions about colors for any number of reasons. Mine happens to be purple, um, and I have some really strong opinions about why I like purple so much. Um, and I, I, I often tell folks that it would be unfair, it would be almost ridiculous for me to walk into a room of 20 people with or without disabilities and say, everybody in this room now has to have their favorite color be purple. Um, now, almost certainly there will be a percentage of people in that room who agree with me and that purple is their favorite color. But as sure as that is true, it's also true that there are going to be people who for any number of reasons have a color other than purple as their favorite color. Um, when we talk about supportive decision making, the moment somebody is signed into guardianship, the they may say they have a favorite color, but it's somebody else's responsibility to make those choices for them. So it limits the power of their voice. One of the things that we believe and believe strongly is that with supportive decision making, your voice is not only heard, 
but echoed because you're making decisions that directly impact how your life moves forward. So legal protection and resources. There are any number of ways that um, when we start to think about supportive decision making that we can incorporate some um, safety protections around it. power of attorney. So giving someone partial power of attorney or limited power of attorney can protect them while still allowing them to be um, the person who renders most of their decisions. Having a joint bank account where it takes a, an additional signature or at least there's um, the opportunity when something is, because it's a shared bank account, more than a single party knows what's going on with that bank account, which can be really helpful when somebody may not have a whole lot of experience um, with money, developing, establishing a trust so that in the event that something happens, there is um, a legal document that says, these are the way that I want things to go. Advanced health directives. Oftentimes, one of the struggles that we experience with people who are under guardianship, somebody else is also making their medical decisions. Now, they may be making them under the best case scenarios with input from that individual. But when guardianship occurs, they don't have to. It's not legally, they're not legally bound to, to ask for input from that individuals. And for any number of reasons, uh, that can be really difficult when it comes to things like advanced health direct directives. Everybody has a, a different philosophy a philosophy about how those kind of things should go. And being able to, to be part of that conversation and, and share what your wants needs, desires are, can be really helpful. Um, also being able to release that medical information to, to other folks, um, authorizing to disclose your educational information, last will and test, testament, and representative paid. All these are ways that um, you can incorporate some supportive decision-making into areas that may be of some concern based on safety or you're concerned about somebody taking unfair advantage of them um, or learning more about where they are medically. These are just a few um, legal protections that when somebody chooses supportive decision-making can be incorporated into that agreement to make sure that all of the supports are there without creating a huge number of limitations. So supportive decision-making in New Jersey, in New Jersey, judges are more informed about the importance and representation of consulting and guardianship cases. Can't overemphasize this enough. Oftentimes, when it comes to a guardianship case, a judge is asked um, to basically rule on something that either a parent or a guardian or somebody who's functioning as a guardian says, this person turned to 18 I don't want, and I don't want anything to happen to them. So they get to rule um, on, 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 on guardianship. What we hope to be able to bring to New Jersey is a much more comprehensive kind of checklist of things that um, a judge could review um, and, and be able to say, okay, they may need some support in some of these areas and a supportive decision-making is a great way to be able to provide the support they need without restricting them um, or having somebody have complete control over everything that they're going to do for the rest of their life. So um, we believe that is tremendously important and will elevate judges through that experience to be able to, to render decisions that are much more um, aligned with what the individual wants and um, can help 
and, and can receive help from their family. So these are some important things to remember about supportive decision making. So really, more than anything else, supportive decision making is a belief. It's a belief that um, individuals with the proper supports can can make really good decisions based on their um, current abilities and the ability to grow those kind of moving forward. This supportive decision making is a skill, and anybody who knows anything um, about skills. Skills are things that we can grow. Um, we oftentimes need the opportunity to practice supportive decision making to grow that skills. And they're an alternative to guardianship. Um, oftentimes when we're limited with either this or that, um, the opportunity for supportive decision making doesn't come up in conversation because as currently configured in New Jersey, it's just not a legal option. Now, people can set up those kind of um, arrangements on their own, but what we're advocating for is to have that as a, as a legal option, uh, just like guardianship is currently a legal option. And to be able to, to share with people, this is something that we feel comfortable doing and in, in that we believe it is a great support system kind of moving forward both in terms of allowing somebody to 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 be at the center of the things that happen to them but also their ability to grow that skill so more than anything else at the end of the day what we really want to share is that your voice counts your voice is is should be the leading voice around what you want to do. Um, now, that's going to vary from individual to individual. Some of us are going to need more support around certain areas. So understanding supportive decision making as an alternative to guardianship. At, at right now, we currently don't have supportive decision making as an alternative to guardianship legally. The next thing is how to choose the right people to be part of your team. That's really, really important. It is what makes a supportive decision-making agreement um, a really good thing for the individual. You want people who both know you, um, know your strengths and your weaknesses, and can support you in whatever way you feel necessary. So how to organize your ideas about what you would like to do and what you might need. Again, having people who are um, really familiar with you, whether they be family members, friends, or professionals can go a long way in helping to establish that. People who have had interactions with you, people who, who can say um, with a degree of certainty that a lot of what you're really good at, um, you're not gonna need a whole lot of support around. Um, oftentimes, the things that we're bad at or, or need some more experience may be the areas for which we can create a supportive decision-making agreement and learn our way, gain the, the level of skill that's necessary to be able to, to move that forward. There's also things like how to create your own supportive decision-making agreement and the awareness of legal forms and resources that might be helpful in your life. Those two kind of go hand in hand. What you want to be able to, to do um, to have a successful supportive decision-making agreement is to be able to understand what kind of legal support you can get where you can have a shared bank account or have a um, um, medical um, is, uh, I lost my words um, a medical understanding where these are the things that I would like to have done and these are the things that I don't want to have done those are decisions that most of us have to make 
all of the time. Um, and it's really important to understand what the legal ramifications are around those things. Being able to share medical information, again, really important. HIPAA prevents almost anybody from seeing your medical information, but if you um, sign a waiver that says, these are the folks who are allowed to see my medical information because they're part of my support team, it can be really helpful. So that concludes um, our presentation on supportive decision-making. Um, we're always available to answer any questions that you might have. Again, thanks for the opportunity to share this information. We think it is tremendously valuable to individuals um, across New Jersey as they start to develop ways to direct their life. But equally as important, we want to make sure that it is, there's also an alternative to um, guardianship. And one of the ways that we can ensure that there's an alternative to guardianship is to share this information and allow folks the opportunity to be able to, to compare what those two options are, but understand that supportive decision-making, as we see it, provides many more opportunities to um, construct an agreement that is specific to an individual based on their strengths and weaknesses, and to be able to tailor that, that agreement in a way that is most beneficial to them and affords them the opportunity to, to be in charge. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second annual New 